I think we're live. Yes, we are live. Yeah, I choose the uh, the wall as my background because my name is Eric Wall. Um, so uh, happy to have you guys here. Um, Niron, uh, head of uh, business development. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Niron Heyman is the head of business development. Avihu, the head of product. And of course, Eli, the CEO of now re quite recently, the CEO and co-founder of Starkware and also board member of Starknet. How are you guys doing today? Thank you for having us. Pretty good. How are you, Eric? I am in vacation in Costa Rica, so I am uh, exceptionally well. I cannot compl I, um, Yeah, would be are, uh, strange for me to complain. Are the bricks of tungsten? Uh, one day, not yet. This is a virtual background. <laughs> so I, I would like to, uh, unless I got anyone's title wrong, uh, I would like to start with uh, a topic that has been circulating for the last couple of months about uh, StarkNet. And I want each of, you, of your guys' uh, opinion about this. Is StarkNet uh, unaligned? And you can interpret that question as you wish, but... Uh, do you feel that Starknet is somehow unaligned? And when I say unaligned, I'm talking about Ethereum, the Ethereum ecosystem, the Ethereum technology. Um, so I don't know, Eddie, do you want to go first? Yeah, I definitely want to go first. So I'm right now in the middle of this amazing uh, biography um, of Einstein by, uh, I forgot, it's like a recent one. Uh, the same guy who's now writing, uh, the, he wrote the biographies of Steve Jobs and recently of Elon Musk. So he also wrote one on Einstein. And also Jake well, Jake. Einstein was uh, deeply unaligned with, uh, you know, physics and everything and so on. And um, I certainly as a researcher was unaligned with a whole bunch of things. Um, and I think unaligned is, means you know, thinking about what it actually, you know, what is actually important and where are you heading and saying, this is, you know, where we need to go or this is what makes sense. And to this, to the extent that the world is aligned with you, then you're going to be aligned. I don't know if this is a good answer. So we are aligned with the long-term vision on what uh, integrity webs are, what Starknet is, what integrity means through our technology. And um, I think to a pretty large degree, we are aligned with what Ethereum aspires to be and stands for, but um, it's far more important to be aligned with uh, the vision and goals than to answer the question of what exactly Ethereum is aligned with and are we aligned with that? Are you? Yeah. Um, I'd say that we are not, we don't, love we don't like to change things but when we feel it's needed we are not afraid to change things so we'll go with um everything that is um we we will par we will definitely participate in all the discussions we will lead all the innovation and development and when when we recognize there is an important goal and it requires a change whether it's uh, proving capabilities for scalability uh, account obstruction, I can name like probably 10 different things. We will go the unaligned way and we will change them, but it doesn't mean really unalignment. It just means that we are taking the direction of uh, getting 100% of our targets and we do that while improving Ethereum. Later on, do you feel like you want to weigh in here? Um, I'll tell you a funny anecdote. Uh, um, Jeff Bezos says he always has to speak last at meetings. So like, because otherwise people will just like repeat what he said. So if you told me to speak after Eli and Avihu, I'm a bit scared. <laughs> but um, I think that there's a misconception in the community that alignment means copying the same stuff that already exists. So I, something I often say is one of the boldest decisions at Starquare was to develop Cairo and not do, use Solidity to develop the stock proofs. And uh, that's done precisely because we want to scale Ethereum. Because of the importance of getting 100x the throughput of Ethereum at 100x the, 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 the decrease in the costs, you have to make bold decisions like developing a new uh, smart contract language. And that 
at the first glance looks like unalignment, but it's actually the most aligned thing. In contrast, some teams are so worried about alignment that they are so committed to EVM and solidity that they then delay stuff like uh, fraud proof in, in implementation, um, which is which is a bit um, a bit of a, a shame. So alignment, yes. Does that mean that uh, doing exactly the same as everybody else? No. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that uh, your your view uh, collectively is that you're aligned with the goals of scaling this massive supercomputer, this massive world computer that is Ethereum, and making sure that the world, the billions of users across the world, are able to access the system, do their computation, run their tr transactions, and that is sort of how you de definish an alignment, like a goal aligned with the long-term goal of making this technology, like realizing its potential. Uh, but I do want to ask like some more nitty gritty specific questions there. I completely agree and understand what you said, Liron, about alignment should definitely not be measured to like with, to the extent that you're using solidity or how EVM, like how much of the EVM you have copy pasted and how much of it... Uh, uh, is compatible or equivalent? Uh, I think I think um, Vitalik himself has even said in conversations that um, if he could, you know, start over from scratch, uh, it's not necessarily that he would use Solidity or the EVM again. Of course, there's been lots of learnings, and if you have the ability to create an execution environment today, then you would make it different. So copy pasting the EVM when you're layer two and you have this amazing possibility to do things like account abstraction and build a, a virtual machine that is more easy to zero knowledge proof. I think that he has said that uh, you know he'd, he'd even consider strongly using something like Cairo as the native language of Ethereum itself. Um, so be, being aligned with Ethereum doesn't shouldn't mean to inherit the technological debt that Ethereum has uh, from many years back. I don't think that even Ethereum is aligned with Ethereum today from a technology perspective, but they made some choices and then have to stick with it. However, there is one thing though uh, that uh, I think also touches on the heart of the alignment question. Uh, you know, there are many different layer two systems out there on Ethereum and StarkNet is one of these layer twos that nearly all of them have their own token, right? Some of them use it as a governance token, but in StarkNet, the Stark token is also used as the fee token. So when a sequencer uh, sequences a transaction, it requests payment in the form of a Stark token. Uh, is this uh, a problem for alignment or are there some strengths with having your own fee token that you guys want to hide? Like what was the uh, sort of core rationale behind this argument of making also the fee token be Stark instead of being ETH? And whoever wants to start can start. I suggest the view start. Um, I have a very nuanced thing to say about it. I mean, I, I'll, I'll leave uh, for Ellie the a uh, larger um the less nuanced <laughs> the, the the bigger the big picture uh about uh, how an ecosystem should look like and uh and so on i just want to comment on very on a very specific point um maybe two things first we'll make sure that the user experience in starknet stays stays very good uh even with it and in particular that users will be capable of paying not just with start but also with eth and very soon, not just with Stark and East, but generally speaking, with every token they'd be interested in paying the fees at. Um, what will happen behind the scene is that uh, what the sequencer will get, what operators will receive, will be eventually the Stark token. Now, one very nuanced thing about that is that we have uh, this program for developers. Uh, we call it Devonomics, where basically fees at least for now, we are running this uh, some sort of experiment. I mentioned earlier that we like uh, to test all kinds of new things, um, where fees are not going just for uh, 
payment to the network operators, but also um, we want to take some part of the fees and give it to uh, developers. Which developers? Developers of the most used applications and developers of the best and most important infrastructure. And when I say we want to, in fact, we already did one round. We uh, gave several millions of dollars for uh, DAP developers on top of StarkNet. And I think that one small but important thing you get from paying fees in Stark token, and this is a small thing, but it reflects on everything, is that the um, those developers will now, if they receive dollars or if they receive Stark token, it's a different, there is a different value in this, meaning they can now uh, affect what is happening in the ecosystem much more if what goes to them is eventually the token of the ecosystem. Right. Um, I have uh, another question. I don't know how techy we want to get, but I do have unrelated to the subject. So I want to I wanna sort of cover it now before we move on. Um, is there something about the specific cryptography choices that StarkNet makes that makes it more difficult to be aligned with Ethereum? Because I know that you know, there's this big difference between hash-based zero knowledge and curve-based zero knowledge or just hash-based cr cryptography and, and curve-based or KZG-based uh, cryptography. And it seems like in the Ethereum domain, uh, when they're moving to proto dank sharding, they're leveraging a lot of this KZG type cryptography, which is very different from the Stark and Hashbase cryptography. And, and I believe that it's also the case, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, that it seems like there are more pre-compiles that the theorem favors that are in, in favor of this KZG commitment. So is, is there something on the cryptography level where uh starknet has to fight a little bit and have you thought about for example doing something like verifying the stark proofs using some type of kz kzg verifier so that question is directed to ellie yeah terrific question and i think it goes back to the previous question of what are we aligned with right so um on this uh, thing i would say our first and foremost alignment is with uh you know math integrity and efficiency and on all of these fronts um as i've said many many times across many forums and by the way on thursday in two days there's going to be a stark at home with a bunch of kzg experts you know zach williamson uh mammy ratzin from taiko um and i mean zach of course of uh, of aztec and uh jim of from binius and uh, Shahal Papini, and I'll be there, uh, you know, speaking about Fry. Um, I've, I've spoken about this many times, but let me say it once again. Um, there is one advantage of pairing based uh, systems in our context, and that is that the length, the communication complexity, the length of the argument, the number of bytes is smaller by roughly a factor of, you know, one to two orders of magnitude, right? The length in bytes is, is shorter. But on every other front, uh, when you look at math or engineering or numbers, um, hash-based Starks over small fields dominate. Much faster proving, much faster verification, much safer. Uh, fewer cryptographic assumptions, much greater scale. Everything is better. So again, what what do we want to align with? I want to align with long-term, you know, future-proof techniques. I want the safest math. I want our users to have the safest math. Having a trusted setup, even if it's vetted by a very uh, uh, worthy set of of, uh, of people is not as good as having something that requires no trusted setup, okay? Now, it is true that, uh, I think mostly for historical reasons, because, you know, uh, snarks in, in Zcash became popular under uh, Groth 16 with, with a curve, and I think uh, Ethereum led the way on that front in, in allowing uh, something that was 
completely inefficient uh, to verify on the EVM, which is a pairing and a snark, uh, adding a pre-compiled for that. And for historical reasons, um, you know, that particular curve and setup got a subsidy. I think it would be very unfortunate if this thing is, you know, becomes enshrined and, uh, you know, you need to align with this thing because it just leads for um, systems that are less safe. There is a single point of failure. It's not quantum resistant. It enshrines not just a very particular proof system, but even a very particular, you know, setup and stuff like that. So it's, it's not it's not a good idea. And, you know, just based on, uh, it's not about alignment. It's just based on, you know, math, security, stuff like that. Um, but I'm very optimistic that, you know, Ethereum uh, led by visionaries like Vitalik and, and Justin and others, they understand that they want Ethereum to be the place where all proof systems have a level playing field and that you don't have a single point of failure or, you know, one, you don't have to fit uh, squares through circles or vice versa. So I'm very confident that Ethereum will once again lead the way and find a way to allow multiple proof systems to play on a um, level field and not force them all through one system that is just uh, leads to worse security. I mean, did you want to lean in? Yeah, just uh, uh, to repeat what Ali said uh, at the end, Ethereum wants to be roll-up aligned, and that means that Ethereum wants to be data availability aligned, but also proof verification aligned. So that means no to very specific set of parameters and cryptography, yes to enabling all proof systems to be very efficiently verified on Ethereum, and I'm sure we'll get that. Okay, uh, let's uh, move on, or actually let's uh, let's take a, a retrospective look on the year that has been, 2023. Um, what were some of the most like, significant moments in view, in your view about the year that has been? It has been an eventful year. A lot of things has happened. But when you look back on that year, are there some significant moments that stick out to you that feel like milestones or surprises or something that maybe you want to remember people of, uh, something in particular? And maybe we'll start with uh, Liron this time and we'll work ourselves down and you'll get to speak last, Ali. Should have prepared answers. I, I'll, I'll, maybe not a specific event, but something, a trend that definitely changed throughout 20, uh, 2024, 2023, I think 2023 you're referring to, um, is that um, like when I, I joined Starkware in mid-2021 and back then it wasn't at all clear that uh, like what we call ZK rollups, validity rollups were production ready or going to like overtake optimistic rollups in terms of adoption and production readiness in the near future. And I think what we saw last year is is a flipping of that. Even like Vitalik made a few comments that he thought that optimistic rollups would would be further ahead of of zk rollups, and that sort of flipped. Um, with with maybe I'm forgetting teams, so sorry, but like Risk Zero, Polygon, with all the different zk efforts, zk sync, Starknet, it just become clear that the, this the end game is significantly closer than we thought it was. Um, and I mean, that's through a bunch of different uh, events with all these milestones that these teams reached in 2023. Um, I with, with I, I don't want to cause a fight by saying this, but like you do look at some of the biggest optimistic rollups, not even having fraud proofs in production, let alone de decentralizing the ability to submit those fraud proofs. And then the, the, you've got multiple different teams running Z ZK rollups at scale, submitting proofs. That's a huge uh, achievement of 2023, all of that happening while there's a broader macro bear market. How are you? <coughs> um, many things, but I'll, I'll just talk about one. I think in terms of scale throughput for L2s and starting in particular, we started the year somewhere with like demand of a friction of a TPS and capability of let's say one TPS. And we ended up the year with uh, days where we went over 10 TPS and the ability to do 100 TPS which is roughly two order of magnitudes uh, in terms of both demand and uh, supply. And I sure hope that we see 
another one or, or, or two orders of man, magnitude uh, demand this year, but we're definitely going to see improvement of at least, I, I don't want to commit too much, but I, 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 I'm sure, or pretty sure that we're likely to see even a close to an order of magnitude again in, in throughput this year. So if we did uh, uh, up to 100 TPS uh, by the end of 2023, I, I hope that we'll see a few hundreds at the very least uh, sometimes this year. Um, I want to, okay, so I want to start with the challenges and then go like with the things that, uh, um, you know, I found, uh, surprising, uh, in, uh, in a challenging way and the stuff that I found then surprising in a very, uh, positive way. So along the challenges, first, I'd say that, um, there are many competitors now. So when we started six years ago and we said, we're going to use uh, Starks and validity proofs to scale Ethereum, uh, no one understood what we're talking about. Now everyone is building their own uh, validity proof systems and they're doing tremendous job. Um, in the context of, you know, uh, Snarks and Starks and KZGs and whatnot, it should be noted that all of the leading validity rollups actually use uh, Starks and Fry, some of them, again, because of this subsidy given to uh, a very specific Roth 16, you know, squeeze it at the very end through that. But all of the scaling is done basically by the technology that uh, we spearheaded and predicted. But on the challenging side, you know, projects like ZK Sync and uh, the Polygon systems, they, they're very good. And, um, you know, they're, they're using EVM and uh, allowing very easy um, deployment of existing uh, Solidity code. And it's a, it's surprising. I thought uh, it would be more challenging to do that, but they're doing a very great job there. So on the positively surprising side, I would say two things that are external but are very heartwarming. The first is the realization of many developers that Cairo is just a fucking amazing language to write smart contracts in. So it's not just that it's a good language if you want to scale your code with validity rollups. It's actually a next generation programming language for smart contracts. Um, that's very surprising, um, positively surprising. Related to that is the fact that we are the ecosystem with the largest increase in developers. And it's not something trivial. It's something that actually many folks were saying, you're trying with Cairo to boil the ocean and developers are not going to come. It's too hard and the language isn't ready and they, you know, everything should be EVM based. And I think the developer ecosystem has proven the world wrong. And this is very, very positively surprising and the last aspect which is related to you know uh what is called unalignment but i call it being aligned with you know uh truth or where where we should head things like native account abstraction multi-calls um the whole notion of cairo and starknet they have empowered developers to build amazing ux for end users. So only on Starknet are all wallets basically with an interface that is Web 2-like. Uh, and this is a fact that is not well enough known by people. But when the masses uh, are going to onboard onto blockchain, they one of the questions will be, where is it easy and yet safe to onboard onto? And on Starknet, all of the leading wallets, you know, Bravos, Argent, have very Web 2 you know, using biometrics, um, things like that. And this is because of being, you know, unaligned or rather being aligned with uh, future-proof technology. So, again, that's another very positive surprise that is converted into very good UX. So I'm hearing uh, the narrative that ZK rollups would... <clears throat> be completely outrun by optimistic rollup that is sort of flipped. Uh, I'm hearing that we are seeing uh, 
Orders of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude increase uh, throughput that the system is, is, is capable of handling. And I'm hearing that there's also been uh, this dramatic change in the uh, sort of um, perspective of Cairo. Cairo used to be this language that was seen as something that was clunky, but it has changed, right? It was an upgrade. The Cairo, the Cairo language was upgraded. So it's not just that Cairo all of a sudden has become awesome. It says it's technology technologically has changed. So there used to be Cairo zero, then there was Cairo one. Now it's just Cairo, I think. Uh, and uh, apparently it's one of the fastest growing and one of the largest developer ecosystems. So we have three great things. Uh, ZK rollups uh, really gaining a lot of surprising strength, and this is surprising even to me. Uh, strength against optimistic rollups. Uh, maybe it's even possible that many of these optimistic rollups will become ZK rollups uh, to catch up or something like that. Uh, and we have throughput and we have uh, a language that developers actually love instead of absolutely hate. So that, that sounds like an um, so absolutely incredible uh, year of uh, amazing progress. Uh, but what about some of the... Um, things that I think Starknet has gotten some criticism for during the year. I remember vaguely, and I wasn't uh, like hands on during that time myself, so I don't have full perspective on what it was that happened. But there was something around a uh, regenesis moment when um, there was something that I don't know if it didn't work smoothly or if there was some small amount of funds that was locked into a contract. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what was this event? Why were some people angry? Was there just confusion on Twitter? Or what, what was the reality of, of the situation? Is there, and is there some lesson from this that you guys feel that you have to do better on in terms of communication? Or is there something just process-wise that needs to change? And that question goes to anyone who feels like they want to answer. I, I can I can try and tackle this. Um, there are when it, you go to mainnet um, as like a cutting edge technology, there are risks involved. Um, it was very clear to the community that that that, that is uh, true, even with something like this. With the the specific thing that you're talking about with re, re, the regenesis and the the, the fact that um, v zero transactions would no longer be supported by the protocol. Um, it's, it's, firstly, it's important to understand the technical reason for this. Basically, um, with account abstraction, now every single transaction goes through, through pro two, two processes. One process is uh, validating the transaction. The second process is executing the transaction. And those, v those V0 wallets didn't have that breakdown between validate and execute. So, you know, you go live, you realize you have to sort of have the structure. Why do you need the structure? The structure basically facilitates account abstraction because now with account abstraction, you can have absolutely whatever you want in that validate function. It can be the the um, uh, face ID from your phone signed some hardware in your in your phone, that, and then the signature from that hardware gets sent to the validate function at the protocol level of the Starknet, not to some off-chain verification. So there's this question now as a protocol: you have some wallets that are deployed with V0, but you want looking to the long term as this thing gets out of alpha to, to be generally available and working at scale with account abstraction. And you make a calculated decision that there'll be a few months now where people will be able to transact with those uh, wallets, but eventually we'll, there'll have to be a cutoff date. And then close monitoring of um, the exact damage. What, what the unfortunate thing with Twitter, especially with anonymous accounts, is that um, the um, people can make a lot of noise when there's actually not some, um, uh, uh, like, like real sort of course of source for concern. So here I think uh, you have like a few hundred thousand dollars uh, across roughly the same order of magnitude of accounts. I, don't, I can pull up the exact numbers after here, but like let's say it's like $400,000 across 300,000 accounts. So you're looking at like average of $1.30 per account, which is unfortunate. I don't, I don't want to like say it's not a lot of money, but there's this decision here. If you want to make this, you have to make this calculated decision of V0 transactions will no longer be supported. There's a, there's a over like more than enough time for you to move across, and then pe people have to um, deal with those consequences. All right. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll add one thing to that, which is just that um, um, 
we have focused uh, a lot of attention on on building and on developers and as a general theme we um we've always done this as because i mean we're building infrastructures and then the developers are needed in order for servicing the users but in the end it is really about offering something that users will use and generally speaking we've become much more attentive to the needs of users and uh, it's something that definitely um you know we've adapted to and we've learned and uh over the past year and uh, i i think users are seeing this and we'll definitely see it in 2024 this increased attentiveness to what uh, users and users need and want all right um so moving our heads uh, from uh, the past and looking instead into the future. Um, it's already, you already said, Eddie, that developers um, are starting to change or have changed their opinions about Cairo, uh, that it's a great language to build on. But uh, what are some of the things that are cooking for Cairo? And I mean both the language and the VM. Uh, what's what's in store basically for the coming for the year that's ahead of us uh, that people should learn about or be excited about? What are what are some of the highlights uh, for the coming year? And anyone who feels like they want to talk first can do so. Yeah, I can start. Um, so not everything is public yet, um, but let's let's uh, set the direction. I think in the first half of the year. Um, we are going to focus on two things. One is um, continue to push forward the performance. Um, that means in particular, we are going to roll out, uh, again, parallelization in execution of uh, Cairo and later um, also faster execution um, by creating a separation in what the sequencer is actually performing and what is later being proven. So you can still use Cairo for proving, but in fact, the execution of transaction will become much faster. Um, and the second, so that's one performance. The second one is cost. Um, first, there is the famous for it for four coming, which will uh, likely dramatically um, decrease data availability cost, which is the major cost per transaction on StackNet right now. Um, and we have a couple of surprises coming there as well. Um, so I'd, expe I'd expect uh, three months from now to be in a even higher performance and a much lower cost. Um, so that's talking about three to six first months of the year. Well, one thing um, that I, I, I just want to add that one thing that I don't know the answer to, but I hope that uh, We'll give some answers to is that um, we because of, we realize that um, some of the early you know brave or unaligned choices as to the core of Cairo have paid off very nicely in terms of UX. Uh, we'll be exploring uh, similar such things and themes. You know what the analog of going uh, full blown account abstraction. So looking at or multi calls or stuff like that. We'll be looking for adding more such thing to the core base of Cairo so that, again, developers can work their magic and have an even more amazing and unseen elsewhere uh, experience for users. And uh, about improving cost and increasing import, uh, um, performance, I did see some, just in the, la in the last couple of days, I saw some tweets from the StarkNet account about uh, modularity, embracing modularity. Uh, was I dreaming this or is there actually something happening here about making the StarkNet stack compatible with using Celestia as a data availability layer? Is that a front that you guys are exploring? Is that something that you have some information you want to share? Because it seemed like there were just some small tweets, not that much information I could find. Is there anything that you're ready to to mention it all is starknet going to open up the possibility to use 
other systems for DA? I can take that. Um, we like to experiment, uh, and I think modularity is not just about uh, data availability. It's also very much about the ability to execute and to prove. And I think that uh, if you want uh, great clients that can publish data availability in uh, high throughput layers, but at the same time also verify execution very fast, you have to rely on proofs. And StarkNet is the tech for it uh, with Caro inside. So we are definitely exploring uh, integration to uh, many other data availability layers. Uh, like I said earlier, the first uh, one will be 4844 in public StarkNet whenever it comes out. In fact, uh, we already um, tested uh, Gurley for that. Um, we did announce that we are also experimenting um, on the side with the StarkNet and Madara um, with the Celestia's data availability and we'll push more the innovation on those fronts as well. So yeah, that's uh, probably another direction worth exploring innovation at, and we are definitely looking into all kinds of things. Um, I can mention Celestia, but I can also mention uh, that we have been talking and still thinking of um, a mode that we call Volition that enables uh, different data availability to uh, be available for developers in the same system. So that's in, in general something that we plan to do in StarCraft as well. Yes. <clears throat> Liron, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think the, the whole concept in like that, that you have one unit of measurement for like all computational resources, whether it's execution or storage or bandwidth, doesn't make so much sense. And I think even with 4844, with having like a data gas and a regular gas, the sort of acknowledge that. And modularity, like one of the benefits is that it gives you that. One, also another comment worth saying, just for the benefit of the, the newer listeners, the biggest I would, bottleneck, bottleneck is a scary word, but like the, one of the biggest challenges is data availability more than the actual scaling of the proofs. The pr proofs, we sort of know what to do. The data, right now, roughly 90% of gas costs go to D DA. It's pre-4844, it's pre-volition, there's a lot of stuff to do there, but like, a lot of people would, would, would are surprised by that. They would think that data availability is a, a minor thing relative to proof verification. But even looking at like stock X app chains that we were running previously, through stuff like uh, Validium. By the way, Validium was a word invented at Stark, right? I did not know that, or more specifically by Avihu. That's like the, one of the biggest gas reductions is comes from beyond just the, the proof verification comes from um, doing using Validium DA rather than putting everything on chain. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff like, um, there's this whole debate, like, do can ZK rollups just send um, state diffs onto L1 or to send every, a representation of every single transaction on L1? And, and StarkNet has opted just to do state diffs because it saves gas. Um, so maybe I mean, it's, it's a, a point about, like, I think modularity helps you optimize each component separately, and it's a good thing. Right. So volitions and EIP 4844, is it is it a high probability that we'll see both of these uh, things uh, affecting StarkNet at the same, like simultaneously or one after the other, but in total during the year uh, 2024? Or, or are you guys planning to wait and see what happens after EIP 4844? Where's, where's uh, volitions sort of happening anyway? Where's, the second what's, one. What's the current? The second one. The, logi okay. the logical one. Yeah. And the maybe one. Well, one reason to explain that is, is just maybe repeating myself. Like DA is one component, but there's a lot of other stuff that StarkNet doesn't have yet, like fee markets um, and just general performance improvements that you sort of want to have be instead of just optimizing only for DA. So 4844 is a big enough lift. Um, Volition is another lift, but they're both probably solving the same thing. You want to solve other stuff in parallel. So another thing that I've seen talked a lot about, and I want to give each of you uh, maybe a chance to talk about this, is there seems in StarkNet that there's a lot of focus on this gaming use case. And um, I want to know to anyone who feels like they can explain what, what is the 
what is the case for gaming being a good use case for blockchains? And perhaps why is it good for StarkNet in particular? Are there many teams that are building something gaming related on StarkNet? And do you think this is something that is going to like shake the ecosystem over the year? Or why is there some, so much talk about gaming in particular? Like why, why, why gaming spe uh, specifically? Who wants to go first? I can start. Okay, gaming. So a few comments. Firstly, Vitalik's whole like post about why we need Ethereum, his first one ever was describing exactly this use case of having self-custody of your assets in games. And uh, the industry sort of evolved to this situation where you had the assets on chain, but the actual game logic was off chain. And um, it's a good step in the right direction, but it's neither here nor there. And a lot of the teams acknowledge that it's just a step towards the ultimate um, goal of on on on, on chain um, proof of the actual the game logic. Um, so you basically have two camps in the gaming world. What meaning? equal but in terms of the philosophies one is like we don't need blockchains at all but one is if we do need blockchains we need everything not just the assets but also the game logic to be running on chain um and i think the only way you can get actual game logic running on chain at scale for the end users is through zk rollups because of the scalability benefits and account abstraction because otherwise you're just going to have um end users um losing private keys you, you're going to have to the, the issues like you need session keys in order to be able to transact um, openly without signing each individual transaction as you make moves in the game. Um, the last comment I'll say is it, it, it needs to be proven on chain. It doesn't necessarily need to be run on a blockchain. And there's a subtlety to that. So basically, you can attest to the validity of the game in, in batches. It could be a daily batch, it could be a weekly batch. And you just know that every single player played by the rules and didn't get special treatments, didn't get any special uh, cheat codes, et cetera. And that doesn't need to be run in real time with these like blocks. Blocks can add overhead that is bad for the user experience. But having some sort of uh, cadence of sending proofs that attests to validity, that is something that a strong um, uh, part of the gaming community does want. Um, there are, if, uh, maybe I'll pause then, others can add stuff and actually talk about actual stuff going on stuff now. Avir, you want to go? Let's just talk about games on StarkNet. I mean, uh, it's the, the, the bottom line is exactly the summary of what Liron said. You can execute tons of computation, very, very inexpensive. Games is a very natural use case where you talk about a lot of computation. It's something that is very hard to run today on, let's call it traditional blockchain. And it's very easy and is getting better every day every month on starknet and we definitely see a future not in like five or ten years but very soon where tons of computation will still be very inexpensive to run and therefore games i'd say that uh, since you wanted all of us to answer uh, my answer would be that you exactly see that um the benefits of being uh, like something that is novel and next generation Developers wanting to have on game, uh, sorry, on chain experience, right? They understand that you can't do it on Ethereum, and you can't do it on you know the optimistic rollups, and you can't do it uh, on the EVM. It it won't scale like long term, and if you, you're going to invest so much time in building a game, right? Give, building a proper game is like you know two years of work just on the front end or something like that of a large studio. So you need something where the engine can can actually handle it. And the most plausible candidate is actually, um, you know, Cairo and StarkNet. So a lot of wise developers are saying, since we believe on-chain gaming is the next thing, you know, not just creating the NFTs and putting all of the logic off-chain, and I think they're right. Um, they're asking, okay, where, which is the platform where, where we can deliver this, um, both now and also to scale to... Um, you know, global scale. Because, I mean, here's the thing about, like, all projects, they start small, right? So you're building something, but your aspiration, your hope is that, you know, everyone uses this, that this is a game that will go ballistic. Now, those of you who've been long enough in blockchain may remember the Crypto Kitties craze, which is, or, you know, then it happened with Axie Infinity. What happens if your system actually succeeds? Well, if you don't have the right technology that can actually scale, 
um, it just won't work. And that's what the successful projects have found out. So all of the StarKix customers that came to us came to us because they succeeded and they were bleeding gas and they you know, couldn't service their customers. And the ones coming to us now are the ones with the enough of a vision to see that if you want to succeed and you plan to succeed and you go past the, you know, whatever, an airdrop or funding or a grant, you want something that will actually dominate gaming, you need to put it on an engine that can scale. And StarkNet is it. One thing we missed is just the naming teams. I, I'm always scared to do this because I'll always end up forgetting a team. So if anybody's listening, if you're not listening, I apologize. My, my goal here isn't to pick favorites, it's just to whatever's on top of my head. Um, there's, there's an influence team um, that has actually a, a live alpha. You can go and try influence ETH.io, I think. Um, there is also cartridge.gg. They're also running uh, on-chain games. There's a uh, Loot Realms, which sort of evolved from those, what was that called? Those, um, yeah, those eight words that were worth like uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last bull market. Um, they've also done some on-chain gaming stuff. Um, Brick, the game BRIQ, it's like basically Minecraft on chain. Um, they've also formed, some of them have a, um, a community called Dojo, D-O-J-O, -O, uh, which is building uh, the tooling for on-chain gaming. They've got the sequencer called Katana, which is sort of, it uses the block, block, blockify uh, sequencer that public StarkNet uses, but it has some wrappers around that that are optimized for gaming and also just has a strong community around that. That's again, using on-chain games, not just on-chain assets. Um, and then whatever, Topology is another team that's built the Shoshin, S-H-O-S-H-I-N dot G-G, that you can actually like, I encourage people to just go to that website and just try and play the game, see what it's like. Again, I might be missing some teams. That's not my, like, not my intention, apologies. All right. Um, one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is, um, do you think maybe not in the next year but at some point uh will there be some level of privacy inside of starknet i think a lot of people sometimes when they hear zk rollups some of them automatically assume that oh it must also be uh, private because it's zero knowledge it sounds like the system must have zero knowledge of what kinds of transactions people are doing but uh, that's actually not really the case. Uh, what's, um, there is information revealed about which uh, account has which balance, which account is transacting with, with, with which account. The only thing that we have zero knowledge about is how were those transactions being proven to be valid. And that is what is aggregated into this zero knowledge proof. Uh, but um, do you, are you aware of any like internal work that has been done to look into like, okay, so how do we go beyond just uh, using zero knowledge to scale, but also make it in encompass the privacy characteristics of the system? Is that something that you guys feel passionately about? Uh, is there something that you want to see in the future? Or how do, how do you think about this question of privacy in StarkNet? So I'll take this first. The first thing I want to point out this, Ellie will like take this to his grave. That's why he wants to call these things validity proofs and validity rollups and not ZK rollups because they're not zero knowledge in their current state. Now, um, the primary, primary benefits of ZK of like actual zero knowledge, it's two things. It's the scalability because of this asymmetry between the verification of the proof and um, the, the actual size of the transactions, but also the privacy. The main pain point for the wider community right now is scalability. So you want to solve that first before you get to the next stage about privacy. Um, I will. I want to make one comment about not so much pri pri privacy, but more confidentiality. So this is an important distinction. Um, and I think it, f it finds a sweet spot where um, it makes more realistic applications for the blockchain whilst not being like, a, I don't know, like I'm just, I, I personally, just get too worried about like how, how the um, regulators and the, the incumbent bodies in, like view privacy supporting um, supported uh, uh, apps without getting to the philosophy arguments about that. So I want to talk about confidentiality for the second. A second, if you run an app chain with uh, Validium data availability or volition, but you the user opts for Validium, the base layer doesn't see the individual transactions and it doesn't even see your individual balances. Those individual balances 
are stored with the Validium Data Committee, whoever that might be, or however that's that's stored. So you can run you can run a Starknet app chain with Validium data availability mode, and go to EtherScan once approved submitted to Ethereum doesn't expose that Eric now has 100 USDC or that Liron transferred money to Eric. But if you're if you go to the committee on that running that app chain DA, that committee knows the balances of the individual users and presumably has the historical transactions to generate those balances. Now that's a good sweet. Others may disagree, and this is my personal opinion. That's a good sweet spot between privacy and full blown transparency of the blockchain, where certain permissioned entities um, have insight and visibility, but the rest of the world does not. So when you look about onboarding banks or you're just running a game, but like, I don't need people in that game or, or trading platform. I don't need uh, random <coughs> people who don't know me to see my balances, my trades, but other people who, who do know me or who should see those trades, do see those trades, it's a good balance there. So uh, maybe I, I, I took it to the other direction, but um, I, th I think it's an, it's an important benefit of validity and that's often not, not really uh, highlighted, this confidentiality. Okay. I agree with what Leon said. I, I, mean, I have yeah. one uh, one comment, uh, which is uh, we want to support also a bunch of cryptography. Maybe it's re it relates to your previous question about what Ethereum supports. So in Starknet, you have this flexibility inside accounts to verify whatever signatures you want, but also we want to have developers and then users enjoy greater flexibility in terms of like what are the cryptographic primitives they can use and how cheap they are and we want to add later this year very very inexpensive uh, pairing verification so that all kind of known privacy schemes and privacy apps will walk out of the box um, and very inexpensive on Starknet so I guess that will support privacy very much Okay, and before uh, we uh, start to wrap things up, uh, Ellie, you tweeted publicly on Twitter that uh, you're looking forward to getting grilled by uh, Eric on a Twitter space. And uh, so I feel like to some extent I have to live up to this world and I'm going to try to Go ask ahead. you uh, a question that sort of tries to cut at the heart of, of uh, some of the things that maybe, maybe is, uh, is difficult uh, for you to answer. So the, the question that I have, and it's been something that I don't know the, myself the answer to. I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop beating around, around the bush and get straight to it. So sometimes I see news about stuff like Ulvetana. You mentioned that you were having a workshop. These are the same people behind the Binius uh, system that uh, seem to be making some advancements towards making the EVM a lot easier to zero knowledge prove or validity proof to, to use the terminology that you prefer. Uh, and and maybe, maybe so at the surprising uh, level. And the, we've also seen uh, in, in the past, but, but you know, happening more, more in a more real sense now with the risk zero team, allowing people to prove native Rust code very easy, easily and provide validity proofs for that. Uh, considering these um, things happening that we didn't know about many years in the past and we're seeing these advancements on like making the EVM more easy to you know, uh, validity prove and making even Rust validity provable, uh, how do you feel today about like this big direction of Cairo? Basically, my, my grilling question to you is, how confident are you today that it's still worth it with Cairo, given the opportunities that we sometimes see on tweets and threads and some small experiments? Yeah, so I'll answer honestly. It's a, a, along the way we made a large number of bets. And whenever you make a bold and courageous uh, technological bet, it takes time to see whether you were right or wrong or somewhere in between and it's too early so i mean i could go on some you know marketing spree and promise and say that i know that we made the right choice uh, it's too early um but let me just point out the two trade offs well the trade off is once uh, at least i thought of them and then something that i realized only very recently on the positive side of the choice that we made so the um, 
there's no doubt that taking building a VM that is dedicated to the constraints of your technology means you will utilize uh, that technology better. This is true about CUDA and GPUs, and it is true about Cairo and Starks, okay? Um, at the same time, it also means that the you have you're gonna it's gonna be harder to get the tooling uh, infrastructure that developers um, care for. And by the way, it's the same thing with uh, solidity with respect to the Ethereum virtual machine or a blockchain machine. You know, compared to using whatever pre-existing programming language was there, right? You, you know, Vitalik and uh, Gavin Woods and whoever was writing the yellow paper also probably struggle with similar questions. Should we take the Java virtual machine and Java? Should we take Python or should we build the virtual machine for this new thing, which is harder? Um, and I think in that case, it's clear that they made the right choice, definitely. Uh, even though, you know, now Solana with Rust maybe challenges that. So even there, the the sort of the jury is out. Now, those are the two sides of the trade-off. You will get more uh, proving juice out of a VM that is built uh, with proving in mind than you will get out of using some other VM. Uh, but the developer toolkit will take more time to build. So now which will win? Too early to say. One advantage that at least I didn't realize early on, but actually is related to this, you know, UX and the developer experience and the UX user experience. By owning on a very deep level the whole stack from the virtual machine and all the tiers above that, as opposed to saying, we take something standard, it was built somewhere else. The ability to offer new features, to innovate and to say, okay, this doesn't make sense, we're going to change it is much greater. So for instance, you know, um, our peers or competitors across the other L2s that are now embracing ERC 4337 with account abstraction, right? It is not. It is never going to give the same level of experience to the end users who are coming. Why? Because they are coming from Ethereum with the Ethereum standard. They already have their EOAs and their ledgers and their MetaMask in a certain way. And now Offering them an ERC, uh, you know, account abstraction as an additional thing is going to be a very, very problematic thing. And now you have like two standards. With StarkNet, everything is based on smart wallets, account abstraction. Everything is already, you know, um, biometric uh, key, uh, bi biometrics uh, secured, um, social recovery, things like that as a baseline. And so this is, you know, the ability to innovate and offer the developers and then the users an integrated experience that is modern and better is something we didn't realize. It's not related necessarily to the proof systems. So summarizing, we made a bet. We made a large number of bets. You know, we started by asking about like KZG and Groth16 versus Stark. You know, uh, there again, the question could be asked. Um, we're also be being challenged every day on that front as well. You know, there are new innovations on folding and stuff like that. And still, we're very confident um, our technological path uh, will scale best. Same thing applies to Cairo. I believe we made the right choice, but uh, time will tell. And we don't, honestly, we don't know yet. Thank you so much for that answer. And I, I see we're, at least in my local time, we're way ahead uh, over the hour. Uh, also, the recording time is uh, one minute away from the hour cutoff. Liron, I think that you have, uh, had another meeting that uh, you're probably late to. Um, unless someone has something that they really urgently want to say before we close out, I want to thank all of you guys for your time. And I'm excited for this next year to come. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Me too. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. All right.